that your gut health affects your mouth health and your mouth health affects your gut health. And so we've all heard of yeah. the term leaky gut. Well, there's now a term called leaky gum. And that's why there's yeah. this huge link between gum disease and heart disease, Alzheimer's, uh, kidney disease. It's pretty much anywhere where those organisms that should only be in the mouth are ending up in the bloodstream and wherever they can go. So they can go into your brain, well, you know, into any organ, let's face it. Right? If it's in the bloodstream, it can go anywhere. Um, so, yeah. you know, leaky gum is, is causing havoc in, in general, general health issues. And um, we need to sort it out, don't we? Episode 25 on the Holocene podcast, and we've got a treat for you today. We've got a holistic dentist. This is Mark Mortaboys, who runs his own clinic called the Mortaboys Dental Spa. Um, Mark is also on TikTok down as the Dental Shaman. Uh, in today's episode, we talk about tooth decay, we talk about gum disease, we go into a lot of solutions. Um, had a little bit of a technical error. Um, I know he had a bit of an issue hearing me at times. Um, and also we had a bit of a malfunction with the camera, but, uh, I've listened back to the interview and it's, uh, it works perfectly well. Um, hopefully you get a lot of value out of this. Mark has also promised to come back on a few more times where we're going to talk about dental cosmetics and we're going to go into other sides of oral health as well. Um, Mark has agreed with a lot of the things I was saying in my heel, um, tooth decay or reverse cavity video. Um, which I'm really pleased about um, because you can imagine the sort of stuff I look into and talk about is normally not widely accepted in the dental world, but Mark has a open mind and he's practiced um, holistic dentistry for a very long time. So he's seen the miracles taking place and I love his approach in general. I think he's, um, I think he's very calm I think he's um, very holistically minded as well, and he shows us in this interview. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, Mark, thanks for joining me. I've been desperate to get a dentist on the show, so uh, you're my first, so thank you oh, for wow. uh, accepting the invite. <laughs> do, you, um, do you mind um, just starting with a bit of your background, just to sort of set the um the stage for what we're going to go into if that's okay yeah and i think um i think we've we've hooked up because i was uh posting something on tiktok or one of your one of your uh contacts sort of knows what i was talking about because it's not just general dentistry i talk about I try and integrate the best of modern dentistry with the ancient wisdom and the insights of holistic dentistry biological dentistry and my, my own fusion, I'm actually, I've given it a, a title, shamanic dentistry, where we're including a lot more of the spiritual aspects of dental care. So it's kind of like a combination of mind, body, spirit, and the physical. And most of us as dentists, I was trained in 1982 in the reputable dental school of called Dog Guys Hospital in London Bridge, um, and had a fantastic first class training in the early 80s. And kind of it's a five-year course so it's you know, sort of end of 86 early 87 qualified did a couple of years in kind of just you know getting my apprenticeship up getting my kind of flying hours up and then for me personally I had to just get away for nearly two years I just didn't really feel ready for committing to many things let alone a, a career for the next 40 years in my life so I kind of did the very common thing at the end of the 80s thanks to neighbors ended up going off, off to Australia for a year and um, doing anything but dentistry, even though I wanted originally to work in the flying dental service and look after the Aborigines. It was just really hard to get a position there. And it just allowed me the freedom to go and explore and do very, very different things, and especially spending time with Aborigines rather than working for them. I actually sort of spent time with them, but did a lot of rural work, um, sort of farming. I was a docker. I drove on the docks. I drove wagons on the docks. I was a minicab driver. On those on those push bike mini cabs, you know, there's what they're called pedicabs. So I had this kind of life experience where Australia gave it to me big time. But then after a year of that, it was time to kind of really go even deeper. So I ended up going to the jungles in in Indonesia, um, spent time in Thailand and Malaysia. And in the jungles of Indonesia, I actually lived with a tribe for a couple of weeks in Sibiru, um, off Sumatra. And that's when my life really started to change because I think um, on many levels I was very holistically minded thanks to my mother my mother's german and she sort of brought us up with a lot of the germanic ideas in herbal medicine you know 
homeopathy was created in Germany by Hahnemann. And uh, back in the day in my childhood, we, we never drank tea and coffee. We just had, well, we did have tea, but it was all herbal teas. Um, standard ones like peppermint tea, which are common now, but rose hip and chamomile, they were the three choices you had when you wanted a cup of tea. So I was brought up very uh, naturopathically and my mother's very strict vegetarian. And uh, I sort of implemented parts of that. And I was vegetarian for a while during my studies. And then when I went traveling, I sort of opened up my diet to local indigenous cuisines and just out of curiosity started to try out interesting foods and was offered very interesting foods when I was kind of allowed into people's houses. For example, in Kuala Lumpur, met a family and they were so keen to offer me their, uh, what was it? It was uh, like a lizard, say sort of um, iguana. It was like an iguana uh, lizard and it was their, one of their pets. And then when I turned up in the evening, I found out that they'd slaughtered it for me to have a, um, a special curry. It was like a sacred curry. So being a vegetarian, I couldn't really say no, I'm a vegetarian. And so, uh, yeah, so I've had some very interesting dietary experiences. And over the years, I've mixed and matched different diets because I'm kind of really interested in the primal diets and how it affects dental health and, um, yeah. and how it can regenerate dental health. If you go back to a primal diet or the Western price diets, which was the diet that was um, exposed by a dentist in the 1930s when he personally traveled around looking at indigenous cultures and you know they never had tooth decay they were seriously healthy had big wide jaws no crowding in their mouths so no need for orthodontics or dentistry really and they really brushed their teeth and then rubbed a sort of a, a bristle of, uh, of some kind of bark or tree that had this antiseptic oils in it like neem and other other uh, i think miswack is another term that people use for those kind of products um so during that travel got exposed to many different cultural differences to my UK um, lifestyle. I then had the magic in, in retrospect of dying twice. I got typhoid, I think, when I was with that tribe, and then I got ill in Kuala Lumpur, and apparently I died twice. I didn't, iguana, I didn't know I it? died twice. Pardon me? It wasn't the iguana, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was after the, um, that was after the event. Um, but yeah, oh, um, wow. with the typhoid, apparently they resuscitated me twice, pumped loads of uh, meds into me, and lots of saline and I came around and I came around a very different person um what some people might call an awakening experience this was in 1990 34 years ago um and it's changed my life because I feel like feel very different to before that time I was very open-minded and curious but now I'm kind of in this very uh higher dimensional space and I've had psychics say that apparently I'm, I'm a walk in, which means that a, a spirit walk in from a star constellation of the Pleiades came into my body. I kind of take it a little bit with a pinch of salt and also kind of I'm open to the possibility that this has happened to me. All I can say is that ever since those days, I see life very differently. People say I have a very magical energy field around me. My hands are healing hands. So when I came back, I went on hands on healing tours with a, another hands on healer. Um, was constantly training when I got back in holistic medicine, started off in hypnotherapy, hypno healing and neurolinguistics, and then moved through so many different trainings, never really getting a, a full kind of um, degree like qualification, but just enough to get a feel for those kind of skills and then workshops where you get induced or in, indicted into their processes like, for example, Reiki. So I've been Reiki attuned um and then went on many crystal and sound frequency trainings um, over the last 30 years so i've always been known as the dentist with the gong and many people have called me a wizard a shaman um, um, um sadhu in, in a fakir in india and i've had a calling to go to india many times and i've had some very mystical experiences in some very special places in india um so it kind of that energetic spiritual aspect I came back and said, I've got to find a way of infusing that into dentistry. And that's what I call shamanic dentistry, which is mind, body, spirit dentistry. Um, and of course, we still have to do physical work. And um, 25 years ago, I created my own practice called Morty Boys Dental Spa, which is not my, uh, my own anymore. I, I sold it five years ago, but I still consult there and give a lot of guidance. And uh, look, I look after the tribe, my tribe of patients who I've been seeing for either 20 to 25 years at that clinic or even the previous clinic. So I've got patients of 35 years um, who are still seeing me. And um, so therefore I've got, I feel a lot of empirical 
experience and knowledge to impart what works, what doesn't work, especially when we're looking holistically and integrating a lot of the faculties of nutrition and alternative or complementary medicine. And at the same time, why things don't work if it's working in other people. So we, maybe we'll talk about that today or at another, another, another meeting, because they're, they're, that's something that's really close to my heart. And I've actually created on YouTube a real simple guide. It's called, they're called dental biohacks. And at the moment I've created 20. So it's my top 20 dental biohacks that are simple step-by-step -step tools to implement change and, um, and increase awareness so that we can optimize our oral health, prevent dental problems like tooth decay, gum disease, bad breath, etc. in the first place. And if we have got that, how can we control it? How can we even slow it down? And ultimately, can we regenerate it and turn it around? Because the research is there proving that it can all be done. But, and there's a huge but here, is like, how committed are we to change and transformation? How committed are we to really giving up the things that were causing us the disease in the first place? And probably the biggest kicker is how late have these diseases been diagnosed? Have they ravaged the body to the point that it's almost impossible to, re to start again? Or is it really early onset where it's easy to start again? Or is it in that mid range where we've got to be super vigilant if we are going to try and regenerate and, and avoid some of the things that are recommended in traditional mainstream dentistry? So it's got to be done in my world with a lot of supervision and communication and taking serious responsibility and working as a team. And I've seen it in medicine. It's happening a lot in medicine now, in oncology, brain tumors in particular, which let's face it, the surgery for a of brain tumor is quite extreme and there are a lot of side effects and potential risks with operating on the brain as we can all understand so if it can be shown that a tumor a brain tumor is either benign or slow growing um, a lot of oncologists have realized that there is merit in screening regularly the tumor to see if it does need an operation in the first place and that's how i feel about tooth decay because if you see an early lesion or even a moderately advanced lesion is there a possibility that we can turn this around and what would be the strategy? Yeah. So the medical model is you come back X number of weeks or months later and then have more tests. And that's what I want to get yeah. across in this video today is that I don't want people just thinking, yeah, I can heal myself, especially my teeth and I don't need dentists and um, you know, I don't want my teeth drilled. So therefore I'm not, never going to a dentist again. I'd like to say, let's see if we can find a dentist and hopefully you've got one already that can be your coach, a bit like a weights uh, fitness coach, a boxing coach, a Mai Tai coach, whatever coach you've got in life that you're going to see regularly to get inspired, yeah. but also check to see where you're at. What well, have you evolved since the last kind of training or the last meeting? So, yeah. 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 I think um, so in your introduction, of course, we've covered very much your spiritual side. Um, the conversation I had with you earlier was very much a obviously you're a holistic dentist but very much a look I'm a real dentist I've got serious experience and I've been doing it for a very long time so I just want to be very clear that you know you do have a very um long and um I'd say professional experience as a dentist um, so. somebody talking to me I'm obviously very open-minded and I do interviews with a, a vast array of different people um, and the reason I wanted you on really is because you're sort, and this is what I loved about our conversation, you're very much in the middle. You're very open. You've got this spirit, you know, this spiritual side to you, which is uh, is great. And it, you're right, it, it's radiating. You know, you can feel it, you can feel the energy. But equally, you're very much a feet on the ground. You know, work with work with your dentist. Don't dismiss the dentist. Uh, it's very easy when you don't you know, you don't have a good experience with your, you know, your health care, uh, your, sorry, your oral care, and um, you then just don't ever want to see a dentist again. And then you're in this world of, you know, just watching YouTube videos. And I think it's very easy to get uh, to, to, you know, to create like a cognitive bias and, and detach yourself from the actual reality. So I liked that about what you were saying. And that's very much what I did. Um, I listened to a lot of podcasts. I read the Western A Price book. You've mentioned Western A Price, yeah. uh, Ramil Nagel, and I found a few others out there. I'm hoping that you're the next guy 
who's the big one who's out there you know i'm a real dentist and, and i've actually seen this real you know um healing going on uh, and we need more people like you for sure um but equally i did work with my dentist and i showed x-rays and um, I've had my so I reversed the cavity and I've had three dentists uh, confirm that now. Fantastic. So I've actually spoken to three. Yeah, because I want to be um, I don't want to run away and live in this shade of grey and think I've done something that I haven't. Yeah, because denial. You'll yeah, don't be in denial. Yeah. Yeah, you'll only yeah live in uh, in regret, I think. So, um, but so was you practicing sort of traditional dentistry and then you veered off to holistic or did you kind of start with the holistic mindset and, and that's where you kind of found your place I think when, when we all qualify we have to go and do our initial initial clinical it's, it's 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 still seen as a kind of a training even though we do just clinically practice but we're a little bit supervised um yep. so it's kind of very mainstream you just did what you thought was the right thing so even in those days I so this is now like 87 for two years I even put mercury fillings in for example but when I came back from travel, I'd woken up and I'd listened to stories about Princess Diana and why she had her mercury fillings taken out, for example. So with my open mindedness and um, new insights from travel, uh, I certainly got the, um, it's the right way of putting it, the heebie-jeebies about mercury. Um, when you research mercury in particular, it's apparently the second most toxic metal on the planet after plutonium. So it is a bit of a head scratch that we still kind of um, even put it in people's teeth. That said, the majority of dentists don't want to because they hate the color of it. They see that it yeah. can break teeth over the years because it's a metal that expands and contracts. And we've all been sold a narrative that mercury in, in fillings, wants, there's only two dangerous times um, when, um, when there's mercury potentially released. And that is when you put it in, when it's soft, and when you drill it out. Um, that's when vapors are released and apparently it's really super safe and doesn't dissolve out of our bodies when we are eating and chewing on it but scientifically that's been proven to be you know very questionable comments that's all I'm going to say on it um, there are mercury meters you can put on people's teeth when they've had an acid drink or they've ground their teeth or chewed some food and it's picking off tons of mercury vapor so science kind of questions that narrative um, yeah. So, yeah, I started off doing traditional dentistry and I still feel there's a massive place for traditional dentistry, especially for so half of society don't go regularly to the dentist. Maybe a significant portion of that are just not looking after their health enough. So if they're letting their or they're allowing their teeth to rot, then they've got to be taken out to stop them dying from sepsis, from jaw infections. You know, upper teeth are linked to the eye and to the brain. People have died in the past from dental infections. And if they haven't died, yep. they've had some lot, they've had significant distress, ending up in A&E with fat faces and needing a lot of antibiotics oh, wow. to get them out of the mess. And then lots of surgery to just remove the cysts, the infections, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge place still for traditional dentistry. And I'm, I'm certainly not on any podcast to say we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what about the patients that are veering towards a more holistic lifestyle and a regenerative lifestyle? And they're in front of a dentist that only thinks the mainstream way or the traditional way. How do we yeah. help those patients? So by doing podcasts and YouTube videos, I want the world to know that there are many, many dentists out there that are open to complementary medicine and dentistry. Uh, there are organizations in homeopathy and acupuncture and naturopathy in dentistry, but they are still a very mi minority, sadly. But it's changing. You know, the world's changing so fast. There's a big awakening occurring on the planet and all around the world with the Internet. There are more and more people communicating their passions for regeneration of bone, um, gum and enamel and dentine as well to sort of reverse tooth decay. And so reversing gum disease has always been kind of po openly possible in even in mainstream dentistry. So a lot of dentistry has holistic principles. The six month examination, for example, is very much a dental idea. Not many people see their GP for a health check every six months. They only go to a GP when they're in trouble. So only going to your dentist when you've got toothache might be a questionable idea to live your life. So going for a six month for your annual MOT and check at the dentist. I think society has been well indoctrinated and a lot of people are very comfortable and have experienced incredible benefits of having a traditional dentist doing that as long as they are respecting their values and they are 
not over treating them. Um, people, dentists have been accused of over treating. And I think that is only really debatable. You can never say whether someone's over treating or under treating. I think what you can say is, is that some people might have monitored a situation rather than treat it. And some people will treat it rather than monitor it. So there are many different opinions. The same you can say about car mechanics. You know, when do you change an engine? When do you change brake pads? When do you change tires? There are legal limits. And then there's a huge gray area when, when you change things. So I've seen, I've seen that a lot in dentistry, where some dentists will say you need to have an old filling replaced or even crowned. And other dentists will say, well, no, I even patients who say, you know, especially the older generation say, well, if it ain't broke, why are we fixing it? And I've seen that yeah. loads of times. And I often say to my patients, you get the kind of dentistry you deserve. So if you don't, if you're a fly by night patient and you just turn up every time you've got a broken tooth or a painful tooth, you're going to get blitzed because the dentist feels responsible that if they let them go, they're only going to keep coming back every two or three years with new problems. Whereas if you have yeah. a patient who says, look, I'm very willing to come back every three months, see the hygienist every three months, four months, six months, get on a prevention program and be regularly screened and maybe x-rayed every one to two years to look under deeper areas that you can't even see with the dental standard instruments, then what's there not to love about that? You know, but as long as you like your dentist, you can afford it because that's the big challenge now. It's one of the reasons why I'm on podcasts and on the social scene is mainly because I know for a fact that the majority of society can't afford, they can't afford food, let alone pay their bills at the moment. So how are they going to fund dentistry? And we all know the NHS is falling apart. The, the current contract is a real mess. Um, the free examination is not there for the majority of people anymore. Um, school dentistry, I grew up when school dentistry was offered, you know, dentists would go to schools and just examine children in kindergarten, let alone primary school and secondary school, just to tell parents whether their children are in trouble or not. We don't even have that in the UK. It's almost like we've got a third world, third world, um, healthcare system in dentistry, if not in, in medical care. I like to think our NHS for medical care is amazing. You know, A&E, you have a car crash, you'll have the best private treatment on the planet. But for chronic disease, I'm not sure medical systems at the moment are really helping, just pushing loads of pharmaceutical products just to dampen symptoms rather than look at the root cause. Yeah. But the only way we're going to do that is by funding it because it takes time. So then you've got to go and see naturopaths environmental doctors, osteopaths, chiropractors, et cetera, et cetera, rather than have surgeries and medications. So yeah, we're it's in interesting best. times, aren't we? Interesting times where we just don't know where where the future holds. But my my optimistic side says it's gonna turn around really quickly thanks to technology and awakening awareness. Because if we know that we can heal ourselves, I think first of all, we need to be empowered and get a self-realization. We can regenerate ourselves. We've been told We've been told for eons that you have to be, you have to give your power away to your doctor and your dentist. So if you can awaken to the fact that you do have those resources, then you've got to not only um, know that, you've got to be able to access it, make the transformational shift so that you take that full responsibility and then have a team around you that can support you. So among, around the yeah. world, I know many, many people, and on my website, thedentalshaman.com, I'm offering a kind of a, like a dating agency, you know, tell me where you live. I'll, I'll, I'll personally recommend the dentist that I feel I know personally that I can kind of guide to. And I don't charge for things like that. I know financial advisors love charging for giving advice by, you know, recommending a product and they get a kickback for recommending a product. I'm very happy just to guide people to pe the right people. And well, so you I get what, too popular. Everyone's yeah. having a go. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like what you, I like what you said. It's like you've shifted your dentist by, you know, initially they were a little bit skeptical and like nervous about things. And I'll tell you now, one of the reasons is I'd say 99% of dentists, if not slightly less than that, but at least nine, at least 90% of dentists are absolutely petrified of getting sued for not offering what's called standard of care. So what we've been yeah. trained to offer for, if we see a brown mark on a tooth, we've got to put fluoride on it, or we've got to drill it a little bit and put some sealant over it, or we've got to drill it a lot and put it, put a filling in it. And if it's near the nerve, we've got to take the nerve out. These are kind of standard of care, standard of care routines that if we don't follow and then a patient makes a complaint, it's almost instant dismissal, right? But mm. we're now living thankfully in the age of consent and our governing councils like the General Dental Council actually say to us now that if we don't offer all choices, we are then now more liable for being sued than actually if we um, 
what's the right way of putting it? If we only offer one choice, like you must have a filling. So I'm hoping to see one day that if we haven't offered even remineralization or regeneration opportunities, that could even be a litigation. That would be great to see because then I think it will wake up the dental profession that there are many patients out there that want that opportunity. Doesn't mean they're going to succeed. They may fail. So I'm well aware that yeah. it's not, it's not, but then dental treatment also fails. You know, I've put fillings in um, one day and then the next day or the next week, the patients had an abscess because it was a deep filling close to the nerve, et cetera, et cetera. So dentistry is not foolproof. And here's the kicker is that a lot of people think that teeth are just these white kind of pearly rocks that sit in our, in our, in our mouths, in our jaw bones, and you can do anything to them, but they're actually, they're, by definition, they are, are actually an organ. So they have a nerve supply, as we all know, they have a blood supply and they also even have a lymphatic supply, a drainage supply for all our, our muck, you know, and our kind of lymph, white okay. blood cells, et cetera, our immune system. Um, and even though it's a hard body, so it's kind of called the gomphosis, which is still um, an organ, but in a hard shell, because most organs like livers and kidneys, they're very soft and squishy. So that's why teeth have never really been seen as an organ, even though they are. And that's also why dentistry has never really been seen as a true medicine whereas every dentist i know wants to be called doctor and they call themselves doctor and we're allowed to be called doctor because we believe we are we are medics but we're medics of the mouth because we you know we see mouth cancer every day well we examine for mouth cancer every day and in our career we will see it a few times i've seen mouth cancer twice in you know nearly 40 years um as students we see mouth cancer all the time because we get shown all the difficult kind of cases in medical school so um, yeah. So there's, do, a big do you know lobby. What, there's a big lobby for a dentist to get more recognized as a medical practitioner. And I think when that happens, I think dentistry will be taken more seriously by the public and also by by the government, because yeah. we are dental, dental health issues is costing a fortune for the government. For example, children are constantly having abscesses in their baby teeth and their first molar that comes in the age of six years of age. And if that's got rotten quite quickly. Due to mostly due to poor diet, but there's many other factors we can go into in due course. Um, the what's my point? The point is that the cost to the NHS is so significant because they they're just having them taken out under general anaesthetic, so they end up having four to six to eight teeth taken out in one go. So imagine the trauma to these poor children, um, but more maybe just as importantly, the cost to the taxpayer to fund all that treatment when maybe a bit of a simple prevention campaign in schools could have prevented that in the first place, or we at least caught it early. And I think I talked to you this morning about my metaphor or my kind of visual image of, of, of disease in general, but it says, let's call it dental disease for now, like a cavity. Is your house on fire? So the house is your, is your tooth or your mouth and your teeth. And then if it's on fire, is it a tiny fire that you can snuff out yourself you know, just throw a quick blanket over it. It's like a kitchen fire, frying pan fire, whatever like that. That to me is like an early onset gum disease. Your gums are just bleeding a little bit where you've got some brown black marks on your teeth. They may be just into dentin or just in the enamel. Can you snuff that out yourself? I would urge caution in doing it just with yourself. I would get a dental professional to support you and help you. And they don't even have to be dentists. There are dental therapists. There are dental hygienists. Um, and maybe an initial examination with a dentist, and then it's kind of delegated to what is called a medicine triaging. Like when you go to an A&E in hospital, you don't see a, a doctor for a few for a few um, hours usually because you get your blood pressure taken by a nurse, you get your history taken by a nurse, maybe a cleaning of the surface if you're coming in really cut and bruised by the nurse, uh, and then you end up going to an X-ray, and then you end up going to see a consultant or a, um, a house officer. So. Going back to tooth decay and gum disease, yeah, if you catch it early, that could be screened in the schools, couldn't it? So you can either then get the children via their parents' kind of guidance to snuff out that early onset decay or gum problem. Um, and then if it's getting a bit more deeper than that, so it's like your house suddenly, you're asleep, then you've woken up and you can smell smoke. But thankfully, there's a chance to get out of this house because it's not ravaged the house yet. So I'd call that sort of mid-range disease, right? So you get up and think, shit, house is on fire. Um, can I get this sorted out? Probably, if I need lots of buckets of water here, I've got to be quick. So, and you've got to be like super, super vigilant and diligent. You can't just kind of just put a blanket over this raging fire. 
but at least the whole house is not about to burn down and you're about to die inside the house, which you hear very commonly from fire brigade folk. So that's to me when the house is about to fall down and burn down and maybe you die inside it, but hopefully you can at least get out and jump out the window. That to me is last resort dentistry where you usually end up with teeth out, deep fillings, root canals, dentures, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my kind of visual understanding of disease that you that could be used in the medical model. I just want to focus on teeth right now because you know it's quite simple. And if people can get it in their minds, these simple analogies, it's really, really uh, motivating to one, diagnose, two, take responsibility, and three, take action. And, um, yeah. and, and going back to the fire, kind of big fire, you need the fire brigade, right? So you need the surgeon, you need the dentist big time, you need the team to kind of put that fire out. No matter how holistically you want it, you, you might want, um, what should we say? You might ask for them to put um, filtered water on your fire, right? But it's still you still need the water on your fire, right? You might want homeopathic remedies in the water, but ultimately you still need the water. Does that make sense? So um, yeah. I often teach people, if you need surgery, you need a tooth out, what would be the best nutrition before you have a tooth out, after you have a tooth out? What's the best mental state to be in? Do you need a bit of kind of mental and uh, spiritual healing before you have a tooth out or de dentistry? If, you've got, if you're anxious about it, if you need loads of cigarettes just to get in, loads of alcohol even kind of loads of diazepam to get into the dentist, then work with your kind of holistic team to kind of help you do some of that more naturally. So you're not intoxicating your body with all those kind of drugs that have a place, but equally are particularly toxic and will, even, will have a downside. So how can we put that fire out without too many downsides? Because we've got to accept yeah. that the fire is getting, you know, the fire is ravaging the house. So we've got to blitz the house somehow. But how, how can we do it within a gentler way? And I think that's what Prince Charles was, or King Charles now, was talking about 20, 30 years ago. And he said, well, he would love to see an integration of medicine. Because back in the 80s and 90s, I was seen as a bit of a quack, a bit of a, an extremist when I wasn't. But that was what, how I was perceived. Um, yeah. and, and all I was saying back then, I'm really saying right now, is let's find balance here. Do we need to do something surgical? Can we be... Can we be more remineralization and holistically minded without um, without the kind of modern drugs that recommend it, like fluoride toothpaste and fluoride varnishes? Can we do it more holistically with other varnishes and other toothpastes and other products, which we can talk in, talk about if, if, if it's relevant today or at another podcast? Because there's a big movement away from fluoride amongst dentists as well as patients. And sadly... I've, I've found over the years a lot of people have been worried about fluoride in their toothpaste and so they've stopped using it even though there's kind of sketchy to reasonable um, science saying that you know, the fluoride ion can actually increase the strength of the calcium and phosphate ions in our teeth. Um, I've always said for years ago why can't we put into our toothpaste the natural minerals of our teeth and there was a boom in the hair industry when keratin was kind of put into hair shampoos. So the original hair shampoos were all just detergents you put into your hair, scrubbed out a bit of your oil so you had a bit more of a luster and a bit more kind of buoyancy to your hair. But actually, people took hair products seriously when keratin and other oils, coconut oil and things like that were put into, into shampoos. So that's what I'm seeing now in dentistry. And I really want to um, help, help really move quite quickly, even the mainstream companies to start realizing that's what the... the um, the public are really wanting. They don't want these toxic chemical shitstorm products anymore. People are, not, are moving away from that in their skin creams, in their hair products, and, and now they're wanting to run away from it from their dental products. But what we've got to be careful of is we throw the baby out with the bath water and end up just brushing our teeth with whatever, um, maybe even a holistic one that's got some antiseptics in it, but it may not regenerate the enamel. It may kill off some of the bugs, but it may not regenerate the enamel and the dentin. So we've got to put things back in like keratin in shampoo. So the big buzz one now is hydroxyapatite, which is the actual crystalline lattice of enamel. It's kind of like a mix of calcium ions and phosphate ions. Um, some dentists have explored using tricalcium phosphate. So again, a calcium phosphate mix. The um, homeopathic brigade have often um, worked on internal. So working from the disease inside out with what's called tissue salts. So you can have calphos, but you can even have calflor where you have calcium and fluoride internally as well. So you know, there, are, there are pro and anti 
um, folk in every kind of department, aren't there? You know, you've got your vegans and your meatitarians, you've got your breatharians and your eatitarians, you've got your fast food people, your organic food people, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you'll always have extremes. Um, and I suppose my mission is to see if we can kind of bring it all together into some kind of balanced balanced way. And if you want to be extremist, I won't stop you. If you want to be an extremist fluorid, fluorid person, then go and do it. But don't push it on us, please. Don't put it in our water supplies. Don't force medicators like vaccines, to, et cetera, et cetera. We need to meet in the middle and we need it. We need enough people to realise there is a middle path and then that middle path can be funded because that's the issue. You've got everyone's trying to do this holistic thing. A lot of it works, a lot of it doesn't. Um, but the, when it comes to funding and science, we're only getting this one path, which we're all starting to realise is is poison. Um, I wanted to ask, well, actually, I wanted to make a point. Um, you were talking earlier about um, the tooth like being alive and it's not just a an organ, yeah, it's an organ. Mm. sticking out of your head. Um, I, don't, I didn't know this, but I looked into this a while ago. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but teeth, obviously you get cavities and teeth rot when you're alive, but when you're dead, they don't. So that for me is like a clear sign that not only is your teeth alive, or your teeth alive, but you're actually responsible because they're part of you. So when you die, if you don't want cavities, then die <laughs> and then you won't. <laughs> but as long as you're... As long as you're um, you're here and you're breathing and blood's going through your body, as you say, blood's also going through the tooth and it's connected to the lymph. And um, yeah, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so I wanted to ask actually, and try to try and steer this conversation in this direction because you you did say you'd come on a few times, which I'm really happy about. But we're going to break down the topics. So yeah. we're going to talk a little bit more about um, solutions when the house is burnt down. <laughs> We'll deal with that another time, veneers, <laughs> implants, you know, things like that when you're at a point sure. of no return. So we're and also the holistic what's options, the... you know, metal free ones, ceramic ones, you know. Yeah. So there's lots of solutions, but which ones are more biological, which ones are more traditional, you know. So yeah, you can always break Yeah, down so what's the safest, yeah. cleanest, worst case scenario, which I think a lot of people want to know. So I'd love to have you on about that. But obviously, if we focus on this one, um, as you've already been doing so, um, gum disease and cavities. So gum yeah. disease and cavities are things that we see all the time. We've probably all had one or the other or both. I think if you, you're not prone to cavities, maybe your gums are more shot than somebody who's the other way around. Um, how far have you seen a cavity go and then be reversed? And in that case or in other cases that you've seen uh, maybe as as bad as that or maybe not as bad as that what are the practical things that people can do when they're in that situation so cavities there small fire in the house maybe a big fire in the house they come to you a professional you're like right i know some guys they got buckets of water let's get <laughs> this going what what you know how how can we save people from um their house burning to ashes <laughs> fantastic and there are, there are already plenty of mainstream ideas that you may or may not have heard about so we'll talk about them because they they're mainstream but they're very holistic as well they're just expensive and a lot of dentists can't afford to use them or to get them in because running one of the biggest challenges in medicine now is the funding of all your your treatment services all your equipment your x-rays your cone beam ct scans and your intraoral scanners etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are some really clever machines that you can have your teeth kind of like zapped with from lasers to um uh, we were talking this morning about using ozone for example where you're kind of just putting extra oxygen onto your teeth because it was proven i can't remember it was the 1930s or 1940s the um, the, um, the professor who who did his research and got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. He was kind of working more on cancer, but he was saying it's basically all diseases cannot occur. Really, diseases when you have a reduction of oxygen in your system. And most doctors know that when you have a reduced blood flow, most dentists know they've ever reduced blood flow to your teeth and your gums. They're either going to shrink back or they're going to abscess, etc. So if it's reduced blood flow, ultimately that means reduced oxygen. So this professor kind of pro proved that you just can't have disease or cancer if there is um, if there's um, an alkaline or homeostasis, an alkaline pH or even a homeostasis, which is a Latin word for balance. 
And I want to bring back what you were saying about um, dead people's teeth. So, you know, the archaeological digs will bring up, say, Egyptian teeth or African teeth from some dig and they will not be rotten in the first place. They may have had some decay in the past because not everyone was immune to it. So I think some people were doing things to foods in particular, you know, for, um, you know, making alcohols, making sugary kind of products, even back in the day um, that may have caused tooth decay. But the interesting thing is if when you're dead and you're buried and the teeth don't decay, could that be something to do with What's the right way of putting it? Ultimately, the, okay, the microorganisms. So we all, know, a lot of us know about this, uh, a bug called strep mutans, which is the causer of tooth decay. It's the main bug, that main microbe, and it's actually it can be passed on with kissing, um, sharing toothbrushes, etc. So you can actually pass on tooth decay to other people, um, and you really can pass on gum disease because there's a lot of microbes that cause gum disease. Um, and in fact, they are not necessarily not there in your body anyway. They're always there. It's just they start to dominate the team or the complexity of the ecosystem or what some people call the biome. So if something gets you out of balance, those what we would call pathogens would then dominate the situation and then bully the situation and cause distress. But I want to go back to if you're dead and buried and you're not rotting, then maybe there is nothing feeding the, the microorganisms anyway. The worms that were fed were fed from the flesh. So we get, it's a charming thought, isn't it? But we're in our, in our cask, in our, you know, in our burial space, and we're gradually eaten by worms. Let's face facts, you know, we get rotted down. Um, and that's what, that's nature. That's what nature does to any, any kind of flesh. Um, but if the teeth aren't rotting, then maybe the microbes, the bacteria can't be fed and then they die or they move elsewhere. So how can we do that in, uh, when we're alive? And there's a huge, huge movement, and you'll, you'll know about it, you've probably even done it. It's called intermittent fasting. You can even be a faster and not even just intermittent. You can have, you know, some people do it for two days, four days. You know, you've got to build yourself up. But if you're not feeding with lots of glucose, because let's face facts, most of modern food is very glucose-based. It's either directly glucose-based with sweets, um, standard sugars, you know, two sugars in your tea and your coffee, et cetera, et cetera or indirect sugars like, well, even direct sugars in uh, cakes, but then the indirect ones like white flowers or processed refined flowers. And then, in, um, then I mean, it's even been said that the, the, this, this current white powder is the most addictive. So people kind of s s scoff a little bit about cocaine and other white powders that are highly addictive. I've, a lot of dentists have said for a long time that maybe white processed glucosey type products are the new addictive white powder that really needs to be looked at because society is going crazy they're getting obese they're getting diabetes with all this ultra processed sugared food so mm. if that's happening to the body it's going to be rotting our gums and rotting our teeth at the same time it kind of it goes hand in hand if you're diabetic you're you're more prone to gum infections you're more prone to tooth decay so you know treating the cause is a huge challenge isn't it because we've got an addicted society to sugar and that's, that's yeah. the elephant in the room. Yeah, everyone wants to treat it. Well, when I say everyone, the medical fraternities, the dental fraternities want to give us more fluoride, you know, fight one poison, which is white flour and white sugar, with another poison, which is fluoride. Because no matter yeah. how much you love fluoride, you have to accept that fluoride is a neurotoxin. Um, it's used in pesticides and it's used very, very successfully in rat poison and kind of rodent killers. So if that's what we know, then why do we just say, oh, just put some more let's fight this problem this epidemic pandemic whatever you want to call it um let's fight it with another poison and if you yeah. don't think about it you'll you'll buy into it so when i didn't think about it that was what i was told it was the company mantra so i always told people you've got to brush your teeth i put fluoride kind of um kind of resins on teeth and up to a point if it's just a little topical layer of fluoride i don't think that's going to be kind of really kind of causing you a big problem a lot of parents have been worried about fluoride in toothpaste because children um, swallow their toothpaste, especially the really young children. They're swallowing the toothpaste and the government advice is a very small pea sized amount of toothpaste with fluoride in it and, and supervise your children. But why are we saying this? Because at the end of the day, we're fighting one poison with another poison. We must do better, yeah. surely. We, you know, we can put people supposedly on the moon. There's question whether anyone's ever really been on the moon. I'm not going down that rabbit hole, but supposedly we would. <laughs> We've got people on the moon. We're getting people going to Mars. We certainly can do amazing things these days. We can constructions and 
and inventions, you know, Tesla cars and all that kind of stuff. So surely we can create a toothpaste that's going to regenerate and remineralize ourselves without causing toxicity. And I've got to, I've got to bring in this story, which I use a lot. And that is the Roman Empire, with all its cleverness, the straight roads, the irrigation systems, you know, they were so clever, but their demise was caused by their irrigation system. You know why? Have you heard this one? Uh, no, all, I don't their think so. all their pipes ah. because it's a, because it's a malleable metal um like you know a lot of lot of uh, lead is used well it's not even used in plumbing anymore for many reasons the expense and also the toxicity issues so um that actually poisoned the roman empire so there was a demise in the mental health of the roman empire due to lead poisoning how fascinating wow. is that so are we now as an empire this kind of modern civilization going to now decay because of sugar and fluoride and whatever else we're all consuming that's in, in the name of health and in the name of prevention of health. Um, so I'm a great believer in that there must be a better way. And if we just put back what is actually in our bodies, like keratin in our hair, um, you know, collagen, you know, all the buzz now is about collagen for our skin and for our tendons and ligaments and for our elasticity. So we're getting a bit sort of seized up in our joints. Let's put back the building blocks, the um, kind of um, the ingredients, let's just call it, of our body. And the challenge we've got is like, how can we get it to absorb? And how can we put it on our teeth when it gets washed off by our saliva straight away? So even a, a toothpaste, as good as it is, within, well, you're brushing for two minutes. So you better hope that that product can do its job in two minutes because you'll either wash it off with a mouthwash or water uh, which I don't recommend because you want to keep those ingredients on your teeth if you're wanting to use them as um, for beneficial purposes. Or um, it's going to get washed off by your salivation because the, the mint or whatever product you've used, the body's thinking it's food. We need to create saliva. We're going to digest it. But all it's doing is washing it off our teeth. And when we spit it out or when we swallow. So, um, yeah, one of my big things that uh, I was talking to your wife about this morning was for regeneration. How can we put a cap over our teeth a bit like um so you've got more chance of so your question is how do we regenerate so if you've got a small fire so you've got little little lesions as we like to call it on our teeth we see them on the x-ray or you see them in the mouth as brown and black spots um, or you can feel little holes with your tongue and then we see them we take photographs and show you what's going on how can you control the magic ingredients the magic antiseptics and the magic looks that um, I've just cut out. I don't know if you can see me or, or not, but my video. Yeah, I can out. hear you. you it doesn't matter. You your body's frozen. I yeah. can hear you. Yeah, so my video's cut out. You don't need to see me as long as you can hear me. Um, let's just see. Guest user. Hmm, don't know. Don't, don't know why. I can anyway, hear I'll you. Just, yeah, I'll just carry on and just say that if you then put a rubber shield over your teeth and then inside that rubber shield is a magical product that is an antiseptic or a remineralizer or a regenerator you can then control it staying on your teeth for as long as you want it and ideally as long as possible but the more chance you've got the more time that product is on your teeth the more chance it's got of absorbing into the into the cavity to remineralize so for the calcium ions and the um, phosphate ions to go from external to internal um, the more time the better so you know I've talked about it for many years with patients. They, most patients or many patients have whitening trays, which are little rubber molds made for the teeth to put whitening treatments in, which are peroxides and um, which are questionable whether they're good for us or not. But at least you've got a tray that could administer any product. And um, we do that in medicine. It's usually in the form of a bandage. So you put like iodine or antiseptics on the skin and then you bandage it up. Or if there's a cut and you want to kind of... Um, um, support support the healing like a burn you'd want to put some oils on like coconut oil or aloe vera etc but again if it's wrapped up in a bandage or some kind of medicated um, uh, tissue whatever you want to call it then at least it's got a chance of of really penetrating the, the wound let's call it a wound so tooth decay to me is a wound and it should be not treated any differently um, to medicine but teeth um, I've always been by, by dentists and by medics have been seen to be very different products, but ultimately they are wounded animals. And if we can put a barrier over them, all the better. So that's one of my ideas. Um, I'm not the only one who talks about it, but uh, there are not many people who do. And in traditional 
uh, medicine or ancient medicine, the word poultice would have been used. And, you know, the, the kind of uh, medical fraternity of the village, the healers, the, um, the shaman would mix up um, the herbs, the minerals, the magic components of healing into, into a poultice, into some kind of gooey material, often with salt and clay, charcoal, all these kind of binding binding products that would bind with the with the camp with the plants and the minerals and then be placed on the skin or the wound and then be bound up with in those days would have been leaves like banana leaves or you know any kind of foliage that can be wrapped around the body so if we do that in the mouth we have much more chance of reversing a cavity so you've, you've got to start getting serious you need to have a dentist who wants to take it seriously or a dental team that wants to take it seriously you benchmark it from day one with a photograph, with an X-ray and um, any other ways of measuring. There are electrical um, tooth decay meters that you can actually, um, it's, it's to do with like light penetration. So you can actually light penetrate and actually calculate how deep and how thin that dentin and enamel is. So you can kind of grade it as what kind of class of, of tooth decay you've got. So that's quite a high tech and expensive equipment and not many people not many dental practices have it but as long as you've benchmarked it in some kind of way then you've got to get serious with the antiseptic processes and then the remineralization processes now i've been blessed for 30 years to have fanatics come to me and i think mainstream dentists don't have that kind of patient i would say the majority of their patients are fly by nights they come in just to have a tooth out and most dentists are quite jaded because they know what they can do for their patients, but most patients just don't want it. They can't afford it. And all they really want is the quick fix. But if you do have a patient yeah. that is prepared to do the work, that's the time to get serious and then show the biohacks, for want of a better expression, the dental biohacks to, to kind of get one on the page of, of what can you see that's causing it. And then two, what can you personally do to reduce, reduce the growth of that cavity how can you kind of one kill off the offending bacteria like strep mutans and um and then monitor it appropriately do you come back every three months four months six months when do you re-x-ray to prove to everybody that it's definitely stopped now that's kind of like a cavity that's in the in, in the open space what about a cavity that's kind of in a really awkward to clean place like, and it's very common where an, in, an impacted wisdom tooth sits against the next door molar, the second molar. And yeah. it's amazing how, how quickly that cavity can heal just by removing the impacted tooth. If you can't straighten that tooth, and you really rarely can only very rarely straighten a wisdom tooth. So if they're causing infections and tooth decay, they are, in my world, best removed. And then you have an open space for that to remineralize just from our saliva. So sometimes it's a bit like a dam or like a brook or a stream that's got dams, if you stop the flow of water, new problems occur. So one of the big factors, I believe, in tooth decay is saliva quality and saliva volume. And if you don't have, have the volume, you're not necessarily washing away the, the scourge of our teeth. So, and, nutri and that's ultimately acid. You may have the bacteria uh, creating the acid, but if that acid created by the bacteria is constantly neutralized by alkalinity, um, and if you've got a healthy saliva level and it's a pH neutral or slightly alkaline, then you've got a massive chance of washing away the cause of the problem, especially if the tooth has been removed. That was the offending kind of obstruction to the to the fluid flow. Um, yeah. So, you know, I can go on and on and on about that. My my biggest recommended tool. So when I um, find a patient or attract a patient that's prepared to do the work, we have a protocol and we put in place numerous numerous protocols to to um, make sure that the the offending microorganisms are not getting their ch regular chance to do that and it's a very complex protocol it may be a separate separate um separate um podcast but i want to kind of answer your question in that um you can do it you have to be pretty really focused and you've got to be committed to coming back and seeing either a dentist like myself or a hygienist that's also motivated not just a scale and polish hygienist there, there are two different types of hygienists it seems like the hygienist that just goes through the motions and just does a nice clean gets rid of all the calcium carbonate on your teeth gets rid of the tartar on your teeth and makes them feel clean at least 
And then there's a sort of very kind of coachy like group of hygienists who are really committed to showing people how to stop it, stop the plaque building up. And um, we use plaque staining techniques where you put food dyes on the teeth to show where patients are missing the plaque. Now, ancient man never used a toothbrush. Ancient man never really had tooth decay. Uh, and certainly ancient man never used fluoride toothpaste. So the reason why we've got a problem is not because we're not brushing, because we're not brushing our teeth, et cetera, et cetera. It seems like what the real problem is, is that the biofilm that's forming on modern mouths is highly toxic. In ancient man, the biofilm was just the biofilm. You can't stop biofilm. You know, the, these films will just grow on our teeth. It's just there's an ecosystem and you get organisms growing on us. But if it's a balanced system and the pH is balanced and the microorganism team are all balanced, then nothing really rots. You don't even get gum diseases. Yeah. yeah? Whereas as soon as that, uh, there is an the imbalance, bio, if there's an imbalance, bio, then you, pardon me? In the gut. Oh, we, we have the biofilm everywhere, including the gut as well. So yeah. it really is. There's nothing you can do about it. It's always there. It's just, is it in balance or is it out of yeah. balance? And you just put the nail on the head there. It's like there are now modern researchers proving, not just postulating, they're proving that your gut health affects your mouth health and your mouth health affects your gut health. And so we've all heard yeah. of the term leaky gut. Well, there's now a term called leaky gum. And that's why there's yeah. this huge link between gum disease and heart disease, Alzheimer's, uh, kidney disease. It's pretty much anywhere where those organisms that should only be in the mouth are ending up in the bloodstream and wherever they can go. So they can go into your brain, well, you know, into any organ, let's face it, right? If it's in the bloodstream, it can go anywhere. Um, so, yeah. you know, leaky gum is is causing havoc in, in general, general health issues. And... Um, we need to sort it out, don't we? So that's why I've gone on onto social media more as an SOS, do my bit for humanity without getting too egotistical. I don't know how much impact I'm going to have, but personally, I don't think masses, but hopefully I can inspire many more people to kind of say the same thing, do the same thing. Because I think at the end of the day, a lot of dentists know about it, but they're a little bit afraid to kind of speak against the narrative or speak differently. We've had this mantra for many years, you know, just floss your teeth, brush your teeth and you'll be all right. And there is a crowd of people who seem to work with that. So let's not reinvent the wheel for the people it's working for. It's let's look after the people it's not working so it for. It drives me mad when I, when I find people that don't do anything dietary, they don't care about anything, they eat what they want, and all they do is brush their teeth with fluoride toothpaste and they've never had a cavity. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, man, <laughs> how can I tell them that what they're doing is wrong? Because it's working. <laughs> yeah, so don't reinvent the wheel for... So that's why... My biggest point, I think, is that's why you do need to see a dentist is that there are huge differences in our body types, um, in our responses to organisms. You know, some people eat what they want. They can be skinny. Some people hardly eat and they can be kind of quite big. So that's a classic example of the. It's not just the food. That's the issue. There's many, many other hormonal factors, enzyme factors. I don't even want to go down the genetics. I don't want to believe too much in genetics because I think we can we can do what's called epigenetics, where you can improve your life by working with your genetics. And that's called epigenetics. Um, I think ultimately um, there's also negative epigenetics, where if you do certain things, if it's affecting you negatively, then change it and then into positive epigenetics, if that makes sense. Or the epi really stands for environmental in, in, environmental input. So you have your genetics, but then you've got the other factors that are affecting your genetics. So are you in a positive environment or you're in a negative environment? As simple as that. Oh, yeah, it can work either way. You could have someone that's not prone to cavities, but if they push their luck too far, they could end up with. And then you have someone like me, for instance, that was naturally prone to cavities. And I can turn this ship around if I really, you know, have the dedication. And I was going to say, actually, um, I mean, do you mind if if I sort of quickly run through what I would do if I was in a situation with a cavity? Love and you would to, you yeah. be able to kind of tell me if I'm right or wrong or what you would add or what you would take away? Um, just to sort of get get a bit of juice there, really, for people. Um, so I think essentially what I would do, number one, is if I was told I had a cavity, um, knowing what I know, I'm not coming at this from a blank sheet, sheet of paper, um, knowing what I know, the first thing I would do is I'd try to kill the bacteria. 
Um, that would be number one. So I would be using things like oregano oil, black seed oil, wheat grass, things like this to to try and like you say put the fire out. Um, at the same time, I would stop feeding the bacteria. So I would stop eating anything with glucose, you know, any white sugar, white breads, things like that, seed oils. Um, and I'd go to as traditional a, a, a diet as I possibly could, probably for an extended period of time, a couple of months, maybe no mm -hmm. takeaways, no alcohol, no, none of that, no fizzy drinks. Keep it very simple. Um, just quickly, actually, just take into one side. If somebody had a cavity, would you even go as far as to say avoid coffee because it has like tannins in it? Or would you say you could get away with a coffee here and there? I mean, to me, that that's probably the the last thing I'd be worrying about. I think it's all about okay, levels that's... of scale. You know, yeah. Let's get let's get <laughs> let's get the that. glucose out there first. I mean, most people are addicted to glucose. <laughs> how are you going to stop people? To stop you know? How are you going to get people to stop the glucose first of all? And it's going back to this toxic yeah. biofilm. So how can you? So I think for a lot of people initially, you have to kind of nuclear attack the situation. You've got to starve starve the microorganisms if um, it's tooth decay in particular, but also up to a point gum disease. So if you see, if you have to, if you initially accept that there's going to be a time period where you're going to go through a detoxification period, and for most people that's a minimum a year, could be a lifetime, but tell you a minimum a year and many years after, where you're just gradually improving your detoxification through cleaning up your act, cleaning up your diet, cleaning up your environment. So yeah. until you're there, until you're super clean and super sensitive to to, to the modern world, yeah, I think you have got to kind of find a way of just keeping the plaque off your teeth and stop feeding those germs. So you can the biofilm. It's a bit like jet washing um, the kind of green stuff that grows on your patios, the lichens and the algae that grow on our patio. So that's where toothbrushing does have a place. I have no doubt about it that we should be brushing our teeth. It's questionable the ways we brush our teeth and there are modern ideas of adding to to toothbrushes so you can even add like red light therapy um so you can beaming like uh, an infrared kind of um, color to stimulate blood flow and uh, to heal collagen etc so you can kind of go really clever with toothbrushing but ultimately it's still toothbrushing and you can be very ancient with toothbrushing and use our wood sticks that have neem oil in them and other other sticks that are antiseptic um, but ultimately until you know where your plaque is, how can you how can you really, really even know if your toothbrushing is effective? Because every dentist, every hygienist knows people who say they brush two or three times a day. You look in their mouth and it doesn't look like they've cleaned their teeth for a year. So they yeah. they are people that just can't see their plaque and they don't have the dexterity. So you've got to show them where their plaque is, first of all. And we've been doing that yeah. for years, you know, ever since I was a kid myself and I'm knocking 60. So for 55 years, I remember little pink tablets that you chewed and sucked and it was full of a food colouring to stain up your plaque because your teeth won't stain coloured because it's a bit like a coffee mug. You're enamel. If it's shiny and, and no biofilm on it, it's not going to absorb any stain. But if you've got this kind of furry, gelatinous, it's mainly carbohydrates, it's a glycoprotein, it's a bit of protein, but mainly carbohydrates just sitting on your teeth. It's going to be absorbent like a like a blotting paper. It will just kind of absorb the colour. And then you can see your, one where your plaque is and also how dense it is, because there'll be places where it's very mature and there'll be places where it's quite young and early infancy. So once you get the biofeedback, then at least you can then it's a bit like getting a blood test and being told you're low in this mineral or that vitamin or you've got kind of low iron, for example, and you're anemic. Well, if you have a blood test and then you get told that you can then take appropriate action. So if you can see where your plaque is. That's the st the basic starting point, and that's in mainstream dentistry. That's not that's nothing kind of too clever, really. But it's still not really seen as an idea for adults. Um, mainly, it's seen as an idea for children, and um, and motivating children to do it involves having parents that are really on on the page. So it's very much a teamwork thing. Um, but once you know where the plaque is, use the appropriate toothbrush technology. We can do a separate podcast just on toothbrushing. But just to say simply brush it off as much as you can. But you'll also hear dentists say, well, then you need to use interdental brushes and flosses to cleanse in the gaps where where the biofilm is really stagnant. For most people, even people with a lot of saliva, there's a lot of stagnation between the teeth. And I'm a huge fan of the water jet or the water pick or the water flosser. So you imagine a yeah. jet washer for your patio. 
you know, some people are saying, well, that's all you need because you don't really need to kind of oh, rush the, the yeah. plaque off if you keep on changing the pH and washing it away and refreshing it. It's a bit like armpits. Yeah. If you can keep getting air on your armpit, it never smells. It only smells when your arms are sort of stuck together on a hot day and you have stagnancy. And that's ultimately what causes acidity and then the microbes that stink and the microbes that cause rot and decay are the ones that thrive in acidity. Because as I said earlier, alkaline and, and our neutral pHs don't allow those um, dangerous bacteria or the kind of damaging bacteria to overflourish. So it yeah, all starts I with plaque. With, all... um, with the water pick, I have a little hack with essential oils. Yeah. So I get it in there, get it right in between the teeth, keep it, because you need to keep it flowing. I think that's um, probably the bulk of most uh, disease actually um, is stagnation. So yep. it's no different with the teeth, is it? You have to keep trying, um, you know, keep everything flowing and moving. And that's what I was saying to the missus today. I said, how well do you actually know your teeth? Um, it was only when I had issues that I started to really check on my teeth. And, you know, I'm up there, I'm moving things around and I'm in there with the water pick and flossing and, you know, and you start to connect with your teeth and you start to, um, you know, like I say, get get things moving and flowing you, you could go a year easily um, in between dental screenings with just brushing and not really caring or being thoughtful or you know consciously aware of anything so we yeah. just connect it back with uh, what's going on up there and in there i think even that sort of gives you a, a bit of an edge totally that's awareness um there's the expression awareness creates the shift and if you can color your plaque then at least you then know where your plaque is where you know some people see would say get to know your enemy all right so um get to know your competition get to know your enemy so if you know where the plaque is then at least you can take it on because it is really an invisible enemy when it's mature it goes a bit more yellow and a bit furry so you can see it when it's very mature but you don't see it when it's young and ultimately it's like a sponge on our teeth so every time we put more kind of acidic products on our teeth then it's going to soak in and it, will, it also sugars will, will absorb in. So then the bacteria that are fermenting it, causing the acids are just loving it. It's like a trap for all that kind of process. And then the acidity just takes out the calcium, takes out the phosphates and away we go. But there's a bigger yeah. subject, as you know, that there is a sort of a theory that disease, dental disease is an internal job as well as an external job. So are we really absorbing all the minerals and vitamins that we really need? um with the modern diet and is the modern diet also causing us disease internally and there's a lot of evidence now supporting that certain foods are actually destroying our bones so carbonic acids and all the kind of fizzy pop is, is now being shown that what we're doing is ultimately the body's releasing ions from the bones to kind of support and neutralize the damaging effects of these foods and drinks so I don't want yeah, to go too much into the science. It's just ultimately it's triggering the body to try and protect itself. Um, and ultimately, I think it's um, the dehydration. People say that if you keep on drinking all these fizzy drinks and caffeinated drinks and alcohols, whilst you're drinking lots of fluid, you're actually dehydrating yourself. It's a bit of a hard one to understand. It's like it's almost like if you drink a pint of tea, you're and so I found it even with herbal teas. There are some herbal teas. I drink a pint of it. I'll be weeing out a pint and a half. It's almost like the body yeah, has yeah. to then produce this water to flush it out. And the theory is, is that to remove, to, to gain this water that we haven't drank, it's we actually have a, ham, a, a camel's hump. And the camel's hump is the, the spine, the, the bones, the big fat bones in particular, that are the water storage tanks. But to release the water, we have to also release the calcium and the phosphate ions. It's kind of like a, uh, a hormonal enzymatic kind of process to release the water. Um, so people who are on very high sugar diets are getting osteoporotic problems. So if yeah. that's happening in the bones, then surely that could well be happening in the teeth. And that's where researchers, I think you mentioned Nagel in particular, um, researchers are showing, well, they've, they've, it's hard to, in many ways it is hard to show it, but it kind of makes sense. But I think they've proven it with bones. I'm not sure they've proven it with teeth, but it's more of a well, hypothesis. Your, your body... Your body would always prioritize demineralizing bones that it needs least, right? So it would probably rather sacrifice a tooth than your spine. Or, you know, we're going to need that spine. Or we're going to need that skull. Yeah. 
I like to think it has the intelligence to choose that. Yeah, so someone, I, and I think this is what I like about um, home, homeopathy, and you mentioned about the calc floor and all of these things. Um, just on a subtle energetic level, it can almost rewire that mechanism where it no longer tries to prioritise specifically the tooth, because I think that someone like me, for instance, um, I did have issues, especially with sugar, not because sugar's on my teeth, rot in my teeth, um, but because it's demineralising my teeth. Um, yeah. So if you can, like on an energetic level, get your body to uh, put the calcium back in or to stop taking from this specific location, and maybe distribute it around. And I think this is what Western A. Price discovered with Activator X, um, vitamin K2, yeah. and also magnesium, boron, and all of these like things that create the bone ma uh, matrix, that they can actually signal putting calcium back in the bone. So let's say, say you do have sugar, the, um, the calcium is pulled from the bone. If you've got the right levels of K2 or magnesium, it can actually then put it back in the bone once it's done the job that it needed to do at the time, which is to put your body into some sort of natural balance. Yeah, I think yeah. it. I think it's. I think the the, the common common vibe now is it's it's D3 and K2. You need to have D3 as well as K2. Is that those two are seem to be the magic elixir for bone and hopefully dental health as well so um yeah and i think more and more doctors are certainly giving more and more of their patients vitamin d and and more and more nutritionists are, are realizing the benefit of k2 as well for osteoporosis and maybe we should be doing this for dental disease uh, for dental you know people with high dental decay or people who've done everything they think they can do um yeah but we haven't even touched on saliva. I mean, we, we've already been talking for an hour and a half. You're you're quite quiet on your volume. Can you hear me okay? Because your volume yeah, has I can gone hear down. You very well. I can hardly I hear, can you hear you now well. for some reason. But oh no, I've got I've got you. Um, I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, I was going to say, in terms of um, the, so I, I mentioned the first thing I would do is try to stop feeding the uh, bacteria. Try to neutralize or kill so essentially arrest the cavity that would be stage number one can we get this thing under arrest and then the second one would be the diet as we've sort of just spoke about and you're just about to allude to is remineralizing the survive uh, the saliva so i guess there's two ways you can do it and what i found the, the not one is better than the other you want both really and that's to remineralize the saliva through your diet so eating uh, more traditional, you know, meats and broths and bone broths and raw dairies and things like this. But also, as you mentioned earlier, putting things on your tooth. So um, remineralizing things, but you can actually hold on to your tooth in, um, as you said, like a cap or a retainer or something along those lines. Um, yeah. So if you if you're eating the right types of food, which you probably found in your travels originally, those guys, their saliva is actually working with them instead of against them. For sure. So um, what what sort of um, things have you noticed dietary wise? Because you did mention at the beginning, your mum was a vegetarian, you was a vegetarian. But as you've uh, kind of gone on your journey, you've found Western A. Price. You've eaten things like iguanas and exotic animals. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm guessing you would probably advocate for probably a higher animal-based um, diet along along the way, would you? Oh, personally, um, going back to balance again, and I've been blessed with, you know, over nearly 40 years, seeing so many different generations of, of people and the senior citizens that I've looked at, you know, the post-war ones, some of them are dying off now, sadly, but, you know, they've been coming into my clinics in their 70s and 80s, full of beans, full of energy. Yes, they've had lots of dentistry most of them and a lot of them have got missing teeth because of back in the day that was the attitude you just took teeth out they may have just had a small cavity or a little bit of toothache and they would have had their tooth out but so sadly they were i think kind of over treated um as a generation but their health and fitness then you just listen to their diets when all our great grandparents and our grandparents you listen to them they ate tons of things that most people wouldn't even think about eating you know lots of kidneys lots of livers lots of fat dripping you know kind of um you know the kind of farm diet where there's a lot of meat but also a lot of vegetables and, and most of them would say yeah i just eat meat and two veg you know, meat and two veg you know that's um I'm, I'm, they have a balanced diet so i've kind of learned over the years 
I think there are two very healthy groups, aren't there? There's this really strict vegetarian vegan group um, that are really healthy. And there's a sort of primal diet group that are really healthy. And if you look into them, you'll find that whatever they're eating, it's all organic. They spend a lot of money on their food um, and it's all from farm shops, local farms. So it hasn't kind of traveled from all around the world. And um, and it's full of full of um, kind of high quality fats and high quality minerals. And what's the right way of putting it? There's a very big crowd in between that are really struggling with their health. And then you look at what they're eating. They're eating a little bit of meat, sorry, a little bit of good meat and a little bit of good vegetables and a lot of crud. And I think that's ultimately what we've all got to kind of look into in terms of our diet is get rid of all the ultra processed foods. But how difficult is that now? Because if you go down a supermarket aisle, 90 percent of food is ultra processed. Um, it's only when the, if you do step outside the box and go to farm shops, et cetera, and go back to what our ancestors used to eat. And there's that's why there's a big trend now is that we're, we're turning back to farm shops. We're moving away from supermarkets and it can't happen quick enough in my world. But there's a group of people who are unaware and maybe can't even afford it. There's always been this talk about organics expensive and you know quality food is expensive. And there's people who can't even afford a toothbrush, let alone a can of beans. So we've got this kind of massive divide in terms of poverty and um, and uh, abundance, shall we say. And that's the first thing. We've got to sort of even that up so that the maybe the people that can't even afford a toothbrush can at least afford some decent food, not just kind of basic, basic food. Because there's what's that expression? We've never been so well fed, but so undernourished comes to yeah, mind. Yeah. So quality of food is much quality over quantity is the kind of key thing here. And even now, this idea of fasting and the ancients used to fast, you know, it was famine or feast, wasn't it? You know, they were hunters and gatherers. They would either go a week without any food other than a few berries whilst they hunt down whatever they're hunting. And then they would have a feast when they've got their animal. And then they would dry and preserve the, the rest of the animal um, and then eat accordingly. So I think fasting is, is is a huge one. I can't quite remember your question. It was, it was something to do with... Um, uh, remind me your question, because I think I feel I'm going off tangent a bit. Uh, well, I was kind of going through what I would do if I was in this situation. and um, Yeah, that's it. you were talking about what sort of foods would you recommend. Here's a, here's yeah, a really, there's two really important things to take away from this podcast today, and that is stimulated saliva goes up a notch of two points on the pH scale when you when you stimulate your saliva. So that's kind of encouraging if you're eating some rubbish. So at least when you're chewing that rubbish, uh, the saliva has gone up a little bit. Um, and if you are really unhealthy, and I feel that's where most of society is, if you have a pH of your saliva of only four or five, at most when you eat food, it's only going up to six or maybe if you're lucky to neutral, right? Whereas if you're balanced and you're healthy and you've got a pH level of seven, when you chew, it will go up to pH nine, for example. It will go up between eight and nine, depending on, on your system, I guess. But if you're ultimately balanced, it's been shown scientifically that you rise up by a pH two levels on the, on the pH scale. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things we've said as dentists, and this is just general mainstream advice, is after every sugary snack, do a couple of things. And the one that was recommended by the chewing gum kind of uh, companies because it supports their sales, but it was proven proven, proven to work is that you chew sugar-free gum for a period of time straight after a sugary snack or a main meal. And because it's been shown that the pH will go up by two levels and by chewing, you're also creating a lot more saliva. So you hypersalivate when you chew. So you're pumping more alkaline saliva or less acidic saliva all over your kind of affected teeth after an acid attack. So that's kind of like one solution if you're going to stay living on the edge with all the dark foods that are on the market. Um, another bit of advice we've given over the years is just have a and always end your meal or end your snack with something that is tooth regenerative. Um, and so that, yeah. again, is anything that will kind of stimulate your saliva. It's, there's been science to show that if you rub cheese on your teeth after a sugary snack, the cheese will be of benefit. That's been shoot, proven scientifically. That will kind of help with remineralization or improvement of the pH and um, and less yeah. demineralization, for example. Yeah. Um, and then one thing I think we so should mention very quickly is xylitol. 
Um, there's this oh, kind of like exactly. sugar from uh, it's not really a sugar. It's kind of it tastes like a sugar. It comes from the birch tree. And um, so there's a lot of pushing of xylitol products, even xylitol just powders. And you then just have a little bit in in your mouth after a main meal. And people are proving that scientifically because the strep mutans can't live with it. You know, it just kills off these strep mutans. And that's great. Um, and supposedly strawberries and raspberries are full of xylitol. So some dentists will even say, well, why not just end your meals with um, or a snack with a, a strawberry or two or a raspberry or two if you've got them? But sugar free gum also makes sense to me. But why not chew a carrot, a piece of celery? You know, there's loads of uh, loads of products, nat nature products that you can just chew on that will make you salivate. And my biggest favorite one is chew a clove. So I teach all my patients to get used to the flavor of clove, a clove bud. And because it's so spicy and it takes a little while to get used to it. Um, and a lot of a lot of patients have initially a little bit of a struggle to have, you know, to take it. But it really pumps your saliva up. You know, you really hyper salivate when you have a piece of clove in your mouth. And then as you as the oils come out, you swish that around your teeth. And you kind of then wash your own saliva that's hyper salivating mixed with clove oil, which is nature's wonder, wonder medicine for teeth. I mean, dentistry kind of evolved around cloves. You know, most dental products back in the day were full of clove oil, which is called eugenol. And um, when I was a child, every dental practice I went to smelt of clove oil. You know, with the modern, uh, more synthetic products that we're using in dentistry, we don't need clove oil so much. But um, there's a massive place for clove oil, for sure. And all the uh, indigenous cultures that can grow cloves are all constantly choosing, chewing clove and cinnamon and all those kind of Ayurvedic spices of the East. All have been shown to be incredibly um, balancing for the mouth biome. So um, wow. the, we, you, know, you could do a podcast for an hour just on the different ingredients and different products that, that are either nature based or modern synthetic based. Um, the one big question mark about xylitol by a couple of companies is that it's so genetically modified and mass produced these days that if you want to be purist, you've got to be careful where you're sourcing your xylitol from. So there are organic places to get it. Um, but again, it's a bit more off grid rather than in supermarkets. So um, it's just to me, I that's just that's going a bit fanatical about it. If, if, if xylitol has been proven, then. Don't worry necessarily too much where it's coming from, but if you can source a better xylitol, even better. Yeah, we use the xylitol gum a lot, actually. Um, what I was going to ask as well, so in terms of um, trying to drive up the pH, um, so you're going more kind of alkaline after eating. I've been doing this for a while. I, I read it somewhere ages ago, but I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it, but logically it makes sense. Um, magnesium oil. So just a little spray, give it a good old swish, and then uh, get rid of it. So magnesium obviously drives calcium into the bone. It yep. really does yep. um, clean the mouth, and it will raise your pH as well. What are your thoughts on that? Have you ever heard that before? Yep, heard about it. Um, I mean, I first heard about it and first used it myself on my calves, you know, getting calf cramp. I used to swim a lot, play water polo. Um, used to get a lot of yeah. calf cramp, and that was the first thing I was told was a good idea just to help with that. Again, that kind of magnesium and calcium exchange in the in the muscles and the blood flow into the muscles. Um, so you just get, you, yeah. So I mean, how much that's affecting the calcium balance? I just yeah. You know, again, it's it's it's. I, some people would say that's pseudoscience. I can't stay here, stand here today and say, oh, there's a research paper that says if you do this, you you get that. But it kind of makes sense. It's obviously anecdotal and makes sense. So something to be further explored. If there's no research paper on it yet, which I don't think there is, then why not? And let's get someone studying that because to stop tooth decay and gum disease, that's got to be important research. So you've yeah. touched on using oils. That's a big subject from using coconut oil, sesame oil, olive oil. You know, the oil that was in your region you know, if you're growing up in the Mediterranean, you had olive oil. If you're in the East, you had coconut oil. Um, so a lot of the ideas have come from Ayurvedic medicine, which is the East. It's very much India um, and uh, the subcontinent there um, where coconuts abundant. And the um, Caribbeans use coconut oil for their hair, skin and mouth and teeth. So ultimately, I think it's oil and the right oil and certainly not refined processed seed oils. Um, I used to think sunflower oil was OK. 
um and then you start doing research into into that and you start realizing that yeah. maybe it's a big mistake you know going to margarine when, when the big margarine movement 20 30 40 years ago most people who've woken up to the mistakes of that are kind of moving back to butters and and ghees and olive oils instead of instead of that so um yeah so oil pulling is becoming a very popular idea it's a it's it's always been around it's three to four thousand year old idea in, in the indian subcontinent and a lot more europeans are doing it thanks to people like you and me because we're telling people to do it and uh, and we do get our critics because people say where's the science where's the science but um like i've said in my biohack series is you know some of it might be quackery some of it might be science-based but they're all kind of intelligent ideas. So why not try them? If you if you if you wait for big pharma to test and research every natural product on the planet, you'll you you'll you'll you don't want to be holding your breath because there's no motivation for big pharma to yeah. research and prove that natural products are better or as good as the things that they sell. So um, ultimately, you will get critics of of natural ideas. Um, and it's very difficult to fund research these days. I mean, it's millions of pounds of research. So to prove natural yeah. products, um, I think it's down to you. How do you want to live? Do you want to just live looking at research papers or do you want to just try some ideas that might be faddy, might be kind of ancient, might be what seem to be good ideas? What have you got to lose? They're not going to be harming us. So let's try them. Let's do that. That's what you've done. Um, you've you've read your read your information. You've done your research. And ultimately, you've got to make your own choices. And that's all I'm here for, really, is to help people increase their choice range, their recipe range, um, and and move towards products that are more God-given to us, right, rather than synthetically manufactured. And I'm not anti them either. I just would like to see a kind of a, a balance of when we use nature's own and when we use synthetic kind of uh, high-tech products. So that's what I'm yeah. on a mission for is balance, really. Um, Mark, so we've been going for nearly an hour and a half. So okay. We probably it's whiz by, to... isn't it? Yeah, it has. We need to probably wrap up soon. But like we said, if we could, if you could come back on and we could discuss a couple of other topics, that would be amazing. And there was a question that I think will be on all the listeners' lips. And I asked it earlier, but we've gone around a few other points, and that is about the cavity. So I wanted to try and finish here with some hope. Yeah. Have you seen cavities that have been even as far as the denting with the right person doing the right things that we've hopefully covered here today? Have you seen those regenerate and recover? 100%. Um, they are extreme. They are extreme human beings like yourself, Jay. Um, it doesn't come <laughs> by accident because if you got the disease in the first place, um, you've got to do some serious turnarounds, right? Um, yeah. And I've got, and most dentists have it as well. Any kind of diligent dentist that's prepared to kind of see if tooth decay can be controlled will have a series of x-rays over a period of time. It does help the fact that I'm nearly 60. So I've got like, even in my current practice, I've got maybe 10, uh, five or six sets of x-rays showing no changes over like a 10 year period. And when you first look at them on the x-ray, if you showed it to 10 dentists, minimum five will say that needs a filling. You know, maybe nine of them will say that needs a filling. Why are you even thinking about it? Um, you know, that's litigious. You know, they get really scared that you're taking a risk. But if the patient is consenting and the patient's asking and the patient is committed and you've got everything written down in a, what we could now call a consent form, then 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 I don't feel it's it's litigious. It's like a, it's an experiment almost. Well, let's try. And if we fail, we'll drill the tooth. Um and but there has to be this commitment to coming back x every x amount of months there has to be no fear about taking an x-ray because there's a crowd of holistic minded people who are petrified of x-rays um and rightly so on one level because over radiation is not great um you know if you have a chest x-ray for example you're really irradiated and if you have lots of chest x-rays you're taking a ton of x-ray mouth x-rays are, are the smallest x-ray you can have It's one x dental small x-ray is equivalent to an hour of flying for example so Sadly, people are coming and say they don't want x-rays and they won't then allow them. Those are the sort of people I wouldn't wouldn't support a technique of trying to remineralize because then I'm kind of going doing it blindly. So as long as someone's prepared to have an x-ray and is prepared to take on the advice and not just say, I don't want to be drilled, because I think it's all about taking responsibility like, ability like you did 
and taking it really seriously. And that's why I've created my first 20 biohacks is like, I would like to see people go through all those and ask me questions. Hey, Mark, I'm doing these and doing that. And what else can I do? And asking all the good questions. I'll guide them to research papers. I'm trying to put it all on my website at the moment because this idea of going more public has um, taken a lot of courage and um, only started about six months ago. And um, so gradually I'm going to be putting all the resources on the website and the guidance so that people don't really have to ask me too much. They just go to a portal for that information. Um, so um, going back to what you asked, for sure I've seen it. And even people that have not been to the dentist for a long time, they come in with black teeth. That is remineralized yeah. teeth. You know, they look rotten, look terrible, but it's almost kind of weird. It's like what something may have changed in their lifestyle. It's usually like people who take meths and kind of other kind of horrendous street drugs where they're kind of comatose for a while and they're mouth breathing. And, then, and when they're kind of high, they're drinking lots of fizzy, sugary drinks. You know, a lot of the, the dance drugs, the ecstasies, all those kind of things. People are taking those kind of kind of uh, what we call recreational drugs would 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 have would come in and say they've cleaned up their act. Um, they don't take the drugs anymore. They stop raving or whatever they've stopped. And they'll come in with a lot of black teeth and they'll say, look, I want cosmetic treatment because I don't like my black teeth. But actually you look at them and they're rock solid. So the so there's there's even proof in mainstream dentistry that that it will stop. But that was kind of man created by medications or drugs. Um, and in those kind of states of euphoria or not knowing what you're really doing, um, they would be then getting into trouble. So I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but I just want to bring it back to that. There is ev every dentist has seen that and that's kind of in your face. It has reversed. But that's usually on front yeah. teeth. And that's the easiest place in the mouth to kind of really control because it's on the front. We're worried about the stagnation zones around molars and premolars, and those kind of nooks and crannies in between teeth. So if you're getting cavities there, they're the hardest nuts to crack. And that's why you need the water flossers and you need the commitment and the interdental brushes, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, I have yeah. seen those turn around. I've got plenty of x-ray evidence. I really want to motivate our listeners um, for sure. But please, please, please take it. Take this um, information like medical information that it, it's possible, but you need a coach. You know, don't just rely on YouTube and our podcast, et cetera. When you do reverse a cavity as well, it doesn't necessarily go back to a perfect tooth. It can actually look a bit funky. It can have a stain. It can, as you said, be black or brown, but it can actually be remineralized as well. Is that right? Completely be re remineralized. But it's almost like a battle scar. You know, so these brown yeah, marks, these brown, these black marks, it's like a, ba a battle scar. Maybe they've absorbed some stains into the matrix. Um, and if it's down to dentin, dentin is always more yellow than enamel. So it depends on how much uh, um, enamel has crumbled away. I mean, there are dental products. There's a company called Icon that if people have got white spot lesions, which are like the first stage of demineralization, you can put this kind of like resin on the teeth and this this process to put calcium back in and the actual white white blemishes will disappear and it will blend in and it'll actually be a, a cosmetic treatment. So you can reverse even even staining, but it tends to be the white stains. As soon as you're brown and then black, you're left with then that legacy. So what you could do is just polish a little bit of that away and mask it with a cosmetic layer as long as you're putting it onto rock solid uninfected dentin or enamel then then you can kind of leave the sort of darker products below and put something over the top if you're worried about the cosmetics um, i'm personally not that worried i know you are worried about it but i'm not that worried about removing a bit of tooth because i've got personally 35 years histories of patients with a filling the filling's never rotted the filling's never fallen out the tooth has been happy and stable for 35 years I've also seen many a senior patient who said they had amalgam fillings as a child and they're coming in as a 70 year old. So for 60 years, they've had these amalgam fillings and they haven't decayed since since there. So I know that if it's done, if the dentistry is done right and the um, the diets have shifted, because a lot of people, when they get fillings, change their lifestyle. It's kind of a shock having to get, have fillings, for example. Yeah. So that's a wake up call to me, a bit like a heart attack. You know, you get a heart attack, you think, shit, I better sort my life out. And for a lot of people yeah, having yeah. two or three fillings. And it's amazing how many people get fillings after three years at university. They go to university without any fillings. And then within three years of not eating home food. So a lot of takeaways and rubbish and pot noodles. 
um, and then a lot of booze and lifestyle change, a lot of all night clubbing and all that. They come back with three to five fillings. That's quite, you know, every dentist will say that story. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I do as well. I've had a few fillings, but I, um, I'm i still focused on remineralizing my teeth because essentially you're then creating stronger teeth around the filling. Of course. So that's like, for instance, wheatgrass, for instance, is quite known for strengthening the bond from the tooth to the filling. So that way, what, instead of, um, you know, worrying about what you've already had done, you're looking at trying to just make that bond stronger so it lasts longer. Of course. So that's kind of um, another preventative thing. And um, one other question I wanted to ask, actually, just while it's on my mind, um, you know, when you arrest a cavity, does that make... So does that make that tooth slightly stronger? So is it harder for that cavity to start again if it's already been fully uh, arrested? That's an interesting one. Um, the, the kind of sketchy research on fluoride ions suggests that the bond is improved if you put some fluoride ions into the mix. So you've got calcium, phosphate and fluoride. So their claim is that it's then made stronger. I personally can't see how if it's remineralized with the same minerals, but it's a bit more porous. It's lost some of the enamel layer. It's kind of crumbled a little bit. I still think it's just as vulnerable. It's more vulnerable to further attack because it's a bit like an unvarnished, unvarnished piece of wood. You know, and if you see enamel as kind of the varnish to the wood, and then as soon as you lose the varnish or the enamel, you're, you've got exposed wood. That exposed wood is much more vulnerable to the elements, isn't it? Right? That's why we varnish exactly. our wood every year or our kind of windows and whatever. You know, you, if you don't have UPVC, if you've got wood, wooden window frames, for example, you'd, you'd do that, right? Um, there is research showing that if you put hydroxyapatite varnishes and toothpaste with trays on your teeth, that that could make it stronger. So, um, so that's, that's hydroxyapatite. So that's like and, and it has to be a nano hydroxyapatite because it's got to be much smaller big thick um, crystals that aren't absorbing as well or at all whereas the nanoparticles yep. are getting through so so to answer your question i think so, uh, i would i don't think they would be stronger personally um I'm, but and so i'm also questioning cavities, whether the fluoride reverse, really does make it stronger if you reverse cavities then they're always well they're the ones you've got to keep an eye on forever more really well, the whole the, the, the body yet. is always remineralizing and demineralizing. We have to accept that we, all, no matter how well we eat, we are going to have foods that are acidic, and there's nothing wrong with that. Fruits, you know, having some melon, having some lemons, having some grapefruit, having you know anything fruity that's kind of a you know, low pH. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good for us. We need to eat. We need to eat apples, for example. You know, it's all you know. I have a joke, and that is like a, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and a clove a day keeps the dentist away. So, you know, apples and cloves go well together. And I also think apples also clean our teeth. Uh, a lot of dentists say that eating an apple is a great way of flossing and cleansing your teeth as well, because yeah, as you crunch through an apple, it's a cleanser of palates, but also of our mouths. So um, um, I'm, again, I'm rambling. I'm, I've lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it's time to stop, isn't it? <laughs> my brain's gone <laughs> tired. It is a Sunday. It is a Sunday evening, so... Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been heavy. It's been an intense one. The thing is, I think um, what I'm what I'm gauging from this interview is you've got decades of experience and correct. You probably shared information as and when with certain patients who have been open minded or you know have been willing to or ready to kind of hear the information. But you've not. This is your first interview in this um, in this field, so you've got a lot of information to throw out there. So um, that's why I think you're, you were right when we first spoke. We should probably break down um, the conversation into categories. Um, but you're, you've got so much to say. So yeah, it's hard to stick to one yeah. point. Yeah, so there's a lot going on here. And um, it's such a deep, complex topic. Even my video, I did one hour of how I reversed a cavity. I reckon I could have gone for three hours. Yeah. I've just tried to... I've, I wrote a lot of it down and I've gone for a long walk and I thought, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to keep it simple. And I was trying to stick to one point and you, you're going around and around because there's so much to it. And that's me. I've only really been uh, looking into this stuff for like six or seven years, maybe the whole yeah. um, dental health thing. 
you've been looking at it for 40 years. Yep. So I can only imagine <laughs> when I ask you a question, your mind's like, you know, it's just bringing it to the listener so they can get the basics of it is uh, is is very difficult and it's quite tiring as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully from this conversation, it will steer people also to go on my website and on my my kind of YouTube channel, The Dental Shaman. Uh, the website's dentalshaman.com. And, you know, I'm putting it on all social channels, even TikTok. And um, interestingly, I get more engagement in TikTok than anything else. So I think TikTok is the new sure. YouTube, really. Um, really quite impressed with how people want to ask me questions. And it's, in fact, that's how we have got talking to each other. There was somebody who, who um, thought we should hook up. And that was only yesterday. And look, we're doing a podcast already. So thank you, TikTok, because a lot of people laugh at TikTok. And uh, there are a lot of serious messages as well as crazy messages going on on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's good it's a tool isn't it it's in terms of what i'm into because i never wanted tiktok but when i started doing this someone said to me you need to go on there i've got some really good value out of it actually but mm -hmm. i'm trying to work the algorithm to only give me what i want i don't want all the nonsense and all the madness i want people like you um sound bites um and i was going to actually just do a shout out to your youtube videos um because you've broke down certain topics really really well couple of minutes nice and simple to the point um and i'm looking forward to you know the journey there because i think that you've probably got a lot more to um to add but um you do break it down really well on your on your youtube so um yeah i really enjoyed flick i was flicking through a lot of them today i really enjoyed that actually well that's the challenge we've well, got now isn't it we, we're all being bombarded and our attention spans are really kind of shocking unless we're really passionate about a subject and you know, back in my day, I used to spend hours in a library. I haven't been in a library for 30 years, right? And, you know, and now it's yeah. Google, it's TikTok, whatever. Um, and if something's really engaging, I'll I will listen for an hour or two hours. But most of the time, you're kind of just getting word bites and little tidbits. And um, I, that's what I felt was like I've got to break break this stuff down. And I only just got started. I reckon I'll probably have a hundred little short videos over the next six months to a year. And just uh, there's only so much time and energy I want to put into it each time. I want it to be authentic. I want it to be real. I want it to be genuine and really helpful. Uh, I'm certainly not doing this to get famous. You know, that's that's the last thing I'm doing this for. It's just to do my bit to help. Um, and um, in summary, I'm getting the kind of feedback I was hoping, and that is that it's, it's really helpful. And then because it's step by step, it's almost like back in the day when I used to get those computer books for dummies. You know, it was it was called so and so for dummies. And in a way, I kind of want to do a dental health for dummies kind of kind of concept because if we just break it down and keep it really simple, you know, the, the really intelligent people like you and I who really want to go down the rabbit hole, they will still get inspired, and then they will use those as launch pads into the rabbit holes. And so I can direct people to that sort of stuff. But I think initially the masses need some hand holding um, to kind of really start that journey because ultimately. This is where the, I'm going to end on the spiritual side of things. What's driving a lot of our diseases is our kind of poor spiritual health. And we need crutches until we get that spiritual health. And so we need a lot of physical crutches, how to guides on how to brush our teeth and what tools to use, what products to use. But ultimately, what's causing all this problem is our inner health, our inner well-being, our inner spirituality. We don't feel worthy. We don't feel loved. We, we hate ourselves. We loathe ourselves. Then what do we do? We kind of want to destroy ourselves. And that's when we kind of abuse ourselves with all the products that are out there to kind of appease that and create that kind of situation from the alcohols and the sugars and your um, drugs, et cetera, et cetera, all the street drugs and kind of uh, recreational drugs. And don't get me started on me medical drugs as well, because there's a lot of side effects on those. And a lot of them are sugar syrup, aren't they? You know, lots of young children having antibiotics in the sugar syrup. I mean, how bizarre is that? But, you know, yeah. they don't taste great. So you've got to sugar them up, I suppose, for children. So, um, yeah, in summary, I'm very proud of what I'm doing. Um, it's kind of what I'm calling my second dharma. Dentistry face to face has been my first dharma as a practitioner and as a rebuilder of teeth. And now it's more of a dental healer and coach. So I'm calling myself a dental healing coach. The dental shaman is just a stage name. I'm not, I don't call myself a shaman in public and, and, and I'm definitely a dentist in public. And I've kind of just fused my word for 
for kind of fusing the mind, body, spirit of dentistry is the dental shaman. It could have been the dental wizard, but it came to me in a meditation and um, people have called me a shaman and I have studied shamanic medicine. So there's a big element of shamanism in my life and I'm, and I'm a huge fan of sweat lodging and I do sweat lodges for people and I go on many sweat lodges and I've been trained to be a sweat lodge um, host. I don't even know much about sweat lodges or we've been in them. That's another subject for another day, but yeah. So lovely no, talking to you, Jay. I look forward to the journey. I, I think it's, it's exciting and I think we need more people like you um, so. that have been there, done the work. Yeah, look, we can all find studies. We can all look at, you know, reading different studies and waiting for funding and all of this. But you're the, you're the type of person that I think adds real value because you've seen it. You've seen it with your own eyes. You've got actual examples of actual things. And one of the things I think that they did that really kind of destroyed science is take out the anecdotal science. It's yeah. almost laughable. You know, these academics will say, oh, that's anecdotal. And it's like, for me, that's what I want. I want to actually see people that have actually done things in the real world. I don't care too much about these, you know, epidemiological nonsense, you know, ten, mm -hmm. over 100 year studies where they've not actually factored everything in. I want the juice and people like you who have done the, you know, the hard graft over the years and thankfully, thank God you're open minded. Um, you, you're going to be unbelievably, um, I would say, um, beneficial to the average person. So I'm really excited for your journey and uh, oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here to um, hopefully, even if five people watch this interview, to promote it, uh, to kickstart <laughs> it. So, um, yeah, so well, re really thank you for coming on. I look forward to you coming on again. Hopefully you come on again. Uh, I hope yeah, that we to. have some good feedback on this. Oh, thank you. All righty. Yeah. yeah, well, have a good evening. And um, yeah, and good luck with your wedding. I hear you're getting married soon.